Hello and welcome to the 1996 season and the opening classic of the year, the 294 kilometer Milan San Remo, the race which goes down from Milano to the Italian Riviera and over the top of the Pass Torcino and then over the little ripples which always decide this race which takes us down into the millionaire's playground of San Remo and here it is making ready for the arrival of the longest classic in the world. This is the 87th running and I'm Phil Liggett and it's great to be back with you once again. 193 riders on the start line today but let's have a look first of all at what happened a year ago. It all happened on the Poggio climb, Maurizio Fondrias breaking clear, being chased by the man who turned out to be the man of the year and went on to become the world number one, Laurent Jalabert. And Jalabert has gone, and he's gone, and he's gone quickly. I don't think Fondrias has any answer. He's lost a length now. Jalabert is going to keep it going. The sprint is on behind it out by Zanini. It won't be good enough. Laurent Jalabert gets his classic win. And what a difference a year makes, because Laurent Jalabert, although number one on the programme as last year's winner, is not on the start line, injured in last week's Paris-Nice stage race, and we hope it doesn't affect his season too much, because he is a man the Anse team hopes will this year really take on Miguel Ingerain in the upcoming Tour de France. Ingerain is in the race, we never normally see him very much until we get to around the May-June time of the season, but he's in the race anyway, we've got a little breakaway going at the moment, breakaway which went clear at around 90 kilometers into the race of Rolf Aldag and Mariano Piccoli of the Brasilia team. There's Miguel Ingerain sporting the slightly changed design of the Bonesto jersey for the 1996 season. This very cool and casual man just gathering in the kilometers and not too interested in who is leading the race at this stage. Well, a marvellous athlete, undoubtedly the most accomplished athlete in the world at the moment, finally landing his first world championship last year with the time trial. We are now 71 kilometres from the finish here. We've been over the Torcino Pass, the 15 miles climb, where in fact Rolf Aldag and Mariano Piccoli were over the top, a minute and 55 seconds ahead of Leblanc and two minutes five seconds ahead of the bulk of the peloton. They haven't really put their heads down at the moment they just sort of meandered their way down a very nervous trek down from Milano waiting for the big attacks this is Ralph Aldag for the German telecom team the team captain by the way as indeed is Piccoli he's the team captain of the Brasilia team and uh, both riders opposite ends of their careers really Aldag at 27 has been around quite a long time whereas Piccoli although he's 25 only turned professional last year there's the peloton still a very big field and still waiting for the hills as we run down in towards the finish. 2.06, they've never really escaped the grips of the pack, although they've worked very, very well together. Piccoli is another one of the upcoming Italian stars, I think. Last year he won a couple of stages in the Tour of Poland, finally making 11th overall in what used to be a very good amateur race, but in these days everybody gets a ride everywhere, it seems and 18th in his own national championships in Italy, which in the Italian championships, I would think, is a pretty good performance. That's got to be the hottest championships around the world on that day of June each year. Plenty of tempo riding being done over these early climbs. The gap is being limited. We've been over the top of the Capo Mili, and the gap uh, swept up the chasers there because there were two chasers, Maurizio Di Pasquale of the Amore Vita team and Luca Pavanello of AKI or Aki, They've both been swept up, so there's only the two of them out front, and the tempo now a lot, lot quicker here. So everybody knows that the Poggio will probably be the springboard for some lucky man in this breakaway. It's only a question of which one. No evidence of the Motorola red and blue jersey at the front of the peloton yet, yet they have great hopes in Max Chandry, the rider who is Italian but English by birth and now has an English racing license. And many of the riders are gathering in long kilometres today in ultra-fast conditions. In miles, it's 186 miles, this event. By tradition, it is not an excruciatingly hard classic, but of course, the distance at this time of the year for many of the riders uh, catches them out anyway. You don't need the little hills at the end to hurt those legs. There's the beautiful coastline here as we scrape right down the mountainside all the way in to San Remo. Number four, sitting off to the back there, Pat Yonker. 
I was with him just a month ago in Australia, which is where he comes from. He comes from Adelaide, in fact, where he won a stage and overall of the two-day race there called the Mount Buller Two-Day, which is a mountain three hours north of Melbourne and uh, a very hard race indeed. And I feel that Pat Yonker this year will actually begin to flower. He's on the shortlist for the Olympic Games for the Australian team and I think he'll make it. Well, very slowly but surely, we're sweeping up the two leaders and it's all down to the tempo riding of the peloton. Once they might feel a little bit free to do what they like today without their automatic leader, Laurent Jalabert, the team made up of Herminio Diaz de Bala, Pat Yonca, Melchor Maori, the former Tour of Spain winner, Neil Stevens, who's having a great season, Alex Zula, who's probably their leader now, Roberto Sierra and Lopez Cuesta. That's the Once team. They ride numbers 1 to 10 because of the having the winner on their squad last year. These are the two leaders, Aldog taking his rest at the back. What a great season, uh, not great uh, career rather, Aldeg has had. He's ridden the Tour de France four times. His best finish, 38, which isn't bad for a German rider. He was 58th overall last year and uh, had some very good results in the classics. He was 97th though in Milan San Remo. That doesn't uh, all well for the bookies for the, uh, for the success rate today but he came back and went on to finish 20th in the Tour of Flanders, which is a very good ride indeed. Climbing high above the marinas that are peppered on the coastline down here. No sign of the big sprinters, men like Mario Cipollini hiding in the pack, hoping it all comes together, then hoping they can survive on the Poggio. There are five small hills as we head into the finish. And the last one is at the Poggio. The hardest one of them all is the suppressor climb. Comes near the end, 5.8 kilometers, and climbs them back up from sea level to 787 feet. And uh, as you're climbing from sea level, that is quite a tough elevation. Jalaber beating Fondrias last year and Stefano Zanini. Zanini ever improving, having a good season already this year. And the Italians winning the two previous years. The gap still coming down now, a minute and 55 seconds. Piccoli, 71st in this event one year ago at the first attempt. Then he went on to get 21st in Liege-Baston-Liege, 47 in the Amstel Gold Race. He really did, even though it was a first year ride for him, move around the top events which says a lot for the team. They quite clearly fancy him as a man for the future. Rode the Tour of Italy, won a stage, and in fact, that was the stage we went into Switzerland on, and then he finished 20th overall in last year's Giro. I often wonder if they really do feel they can hold off the whole field in Milan San Remo. They went clear at around about 90 kilometers covered and we're now into the last 45 50 kilometers of the race so they've been out there an awful long way there's big mig and he's having a little chat there with inigo cuesta lopez well at least they'll speak the same language although i would think the salary scale is quite a long way apart and miguel injerain just tapping out the kilometers into those big legs thinking only of one thing or well, maybe two this year, because I have a feeling he'll look to do the double, a, comma, and a gold medal in the time trial in the Olympic Games and his sixth consecutive victory in the Tour de France. And I think if he does both of those things, it wouldn't surprise me if he then announces his retirement from the sport, because there really isn't much left for him, apart from the annual uh, five or six million dollars salary he probably receives. Well, Saiko and Mape are the riders who are setting the pace, the two big teams, because they have the men they feel can deliver the goats if it comes to a sprint, or if indeed it doesn't come to a sprint. Franco Ballerini's in there, Bortolami, of course, Johan Museu. They will be the men to take it out for Mape, for sure. And Saiko have got Cipollini on the team this year, and Francesco Casagrande. Calcaterra, which seems to be... Uh, a name the Spanish, or the, rather the Italians, are fancying much today. 
And notice now one, two, three, four, five Motorola riders have sniffed their way to the front. Which means that Max Shandry has probably pushed them up there because Shandry knows now that it, it's the time to start paying very close attention on these small climbs. The break can go at any moment. We're just into Alassio, also the finishing area of a famous classic which runs in from Nice every year. But the man setting the pace now from Radio Tour, as it were, is Axel Merckx, I'm told, from Motorola. And the gap is continuing to fall. And in fact, the cars behind now are getting a little bit nervous. They're continually checking back because they're expecting to see the big peloton come herding around that corner at any minute. Piccoli. He really has uh, at least been a star on Italian television for some hours today. Down onto the coast road briefly before we climb again. The first time this classic was held was back in 1907. We're now up to round number 87 of this. And the winner in 1907, by the way, was the great Frenchman uh, Lucien Petit Breton, who was really was the uh, Miguel Indurain and the Eddie Merckx of his era. Not too much effort being done at the back. The riders uh, with a couple of 150 kilometers in their legs are now just happily riding along at the back, waiting to see San Remo. This is where the action is at the Rabo Bank, and now trying to get this race going as well because the Rabo boys have a real chance here of providing us with a winner too. It's Leon Van Bon, I think, pushing the pace. And it wouldn't be Milan San Remo if we didn't see at least one train go by the peloton during our commentary. We usually see the uh, passengers hanging out the windows though, perhaps that was an empty one. And still setting the pace here, Leon Van Bon, a rider who is developing also very, very well indeed. The Rabobank, a new team on the block this year, replacing the Novell team, which in turn replaced the word perfect team, but they're still managed by the same manager, Jan Raas, former world champion, although Jan has passed down the driver's seat of the director sport East car this year to a great guy, Theo de Roy, who has uh, now retired from the sport and raced with Panasonic in his late years. Speaks very good English and very popular with riders, journalists and spectators alike. Still the pace is fairly high. Miguel Indurain's teammate, uh, Arieta Gonzalez, number 34, we saw that. He'll be a man who'll be expected to be right up alongside Big Mig in the early stages of the mountains in the Tour de France. In no hurry yet to race to the finishing podium, though. The beautiful buildings here as we wind our way now down towards San Remo. Peloton on average speed of around about 45 kilometers now at the moment, 28 miles an hour. Aldag still stamping on those pedals, those long legs, which has brought him many victories over his career. Last year picked up a stage in the French race, the Tour of Limousin. Lovely wooded area of France and the home of the former eternal second, as he was so-called in the years of the Tour de France in the 60s, early 70s, Raymond Poulidor. Two team leaders proving why they're team leaders, perhaps. Both got one on the frame, so they're the choice of the director sportif to lead their respective teams today and getting out and giving a captain's direction. The capo servo here, and I think that uh, the gap is down to less than a minute now. There's the Torcino, is the big peak. The Cap Emilia is where we are. 52 kilometers still to race. The Tifosi, many of them having come up here by bicycle to cheer the riders over the top. and even by uh, Mobilette, or the little scooters you see parked on the side of the road there. 
Andre Schmil for Lotto in the center of our picture in the red jersey. Here's Alex Zula coming up now, very coolly towards the front. Oh, and I need a touch of wheels there with the shuffle the peloton. The Gavis team are moving all the men forward. And the champion of Italy is right up here now, our old friend Gianni Bugno. He hasn't won a race since he picked up that title. And Cuesta Lopez, number 10 from Onse. Also playing a reasonably prominent role. We've seen him a couple of times at the moment. Now the Gaywiz team continue to stamp on the pedals. So as we head up the, towards the top of the Capo Mili, the Gaywiz team are now beginning to push all of their men to the front to try and finish this breakaway. They've got Dario Bataro on the front here. It looks as though we're being treated to a seven or eight man team time trial. Gaywiz have a good strong team here with Evgeny Berzin leading them today, a rider who's refining the form after a sort of down period a year ago. Before that, of course, he'd won the Tour of Italy, faced a lot of criticism, a lot of riders said they didn't like him, but he seems to be refining himself and uh, maybe he'll be among the starters again as favourite uh, for this year's Giro. There's the gap, 54 seconds, so they're holding everything at the moment. Here's Berzin. And just about room for the spectators. Whatever you do, don't step back. It's a long way off the mountain. The whole field running down the tunnels. These are the tunnels which pepper Italy, of course, and have caused in the past many serious accidents. At least you can see through these because they're only there to hold the snow off the rocks or the heavy likelihood of, a la of an avalanche and push the rocks over the road and down into the valley. But uh, many times in the Dolomite, the tunnels are wet and very dark, and that's where they suffer the serious problems in the big races like the Tour of Italy. Back up with the leaders here, they're working very, very well together, but well they should. They've been out in the lead now for around about 160 kilometres, and going down the hill here you caught a glimpse there, 50.5 kilometres an hour, 32 miles an hour down the hill, not terribly quick. But they're running with a little bit of a breeze on the nose as they run down the side of the mountain here. Into Andorra, not to be confused with the slightly different spelling of the principal in Spain, principality in Spain rather, Andorra, where the Festina team are registered. They're being led here today by Laurent Dufault and Richard Varenk. We haven't seen either of them in the action yet. And the Gent Wedelgum winner of a year ago, Lars Mikkelsen of Denmark. And I was with Lars in Australia this year and we went training together. Well, he went training, I went for a ride. He won one race uh, in a town called uh, Barwon Heads, which is just on the outskirts of Melbourne on St. Philip Bay. And although you expect in Australia in January to be lovely warm and sunny, I have to tell you it was raining. The long descent. There's always two distinct groups of riders in Milan San Remo, the group who sit at the back for the miles and the half at the front who want the result. Well, let's hope that Jalabers exit from this race before the start because of the problems with his knee. Don't keep him off the bike too long. This was the start of what turned out to be a regal season for Jalaber last year when he won this event. He went on to win the most races in the world of the top bike riders, although uh, Roberto Gaggioli claims a couple more in America, but they weren't quite of the same quality as Laurent Jalabert's 28 victories, which catapulted him up to the world number one over Indurain and Tony Rominger, or indeed Tony Rominger and Indurain, as it is at the end of the year. How the other half live, although the weather today it's not the height of summer by any means, it's around about 60 degrees. 45 seconds, they're still just about clawing these two back. They're putting up a tremendous show of defiance. They're both working well together. And as professionals, of course, they've been stealing a lot of worldwide television time. Here's old Ag, still not looking like a tired man at all, is he? 
as we move towards the Capo Servo now. Still a lot of power in those big legs of Rolfs and Piccoli. The Brasiliat team came in as a reasonably small team, but they keep popping up with the good results these days. Still turning over those big gears. It's always a big gear race, Milan San Remo, and they've got the big chain wing uh, rolling here now. Still, there's no sign at all of the pressure in the peloton, otherwise they wouldn't be as packed as this at the back. Just catching a glimpse there of uh, one or two of the riders who uh, we hope will do well as the time goes on. Francesco Casagrande was number 202 from Seiko. Sitting there near the back. Not the place to be. Uh, especially if you've got a chance now of getting up to the front because you see the way the peloton packs the road here it is very difficult to make progress through the bunch to take part in the attacks and as we run out of these small climbs we've still got the suppressor to come and I think that's where we'll see the men start to build up the big speed whether they'll reel in the two leaders before then surely they will reel them in very shortly now we'll have to wait and see But if you just concentrate on the peloton there and watch the movement as riders try to get through and then they seem to hit the barriers and get pushed back into their place because these riders at the front here just keep tapping out the same rhythm. But one man who is certainly paying close attention is uh, a couple of rows back there, Andre Schmill from the Lotto team. He's always been at or near the front the whole time. Back up to the leaders, still working well together. Two completely different stylists here. The tall, long legs uh, of Rolf Aldag and the more squat little climber position of Piccoli. And there's the gap, and they are now reeling them in very, very quickly indeed. Maybe 10, 15 seconds, that's all. But what a breakaway it's been. By the time they get caught, and there's the peloton just peeping around the corner. So they're going to be swept up on this climb here. They'll have been in the lead for just on 100 miles, 160 kilometers. Well, Aldag here used to riding with a partner because of his six-day victory in Dortmund in the winter with Danny Clark. We're sorry about a little bit of the picture breakup here, but it's the usual problem with the trees affecting the signals going up from the motorcycles up to the helicopter ahead of the race. Capo Servo, that's where we are. They've still got the best part of 30 miles to run, 47 kilometers. And I think that their luck is about to run out here because the peloton has them now in sight on the straights. And here they are, still a massive field. And still up near the front there, you can't see him, but I know he's there, is Andrea Tafi. And he is trying now to set the pace for the Map AGB boys and try and perhaps move up Bortolami or Museu. Perhaps even Abraham Olano riding his first season in the rainbow jersey of world champion. The descent pulling the race into a long line and there's the speed, still nothing uh, particular. That's the average speed for the whole race today, 25 miles an hour. So it's been a gentle cruise the early hours of the day. They weren't racing too hard. Everybody seemed to be very tense and nervous very often and Milan San Remo gets off to a very fast start, but it didn't seem to happen this year. But they're going to make amends now, I'm sure of that, because once they pick up these two, then we are going to see everybody launch into the attack. Aldag knows now that they're not far behind because he was looking over his shoulder there, but he's still got a gap. And we're out of sight around this bend, so it looks to be still around about 20, 25 seconds. They're hanging on. They refuse to put out the white flag. 
Piccoli along with Leonardo Pipoli. They were the two sort of finds of last year's Giro d'Italia. He still looks pretty cool, doesn't he? And so too does Alag. Almost a smile there, as if uh, acknowledging to the camera he knows they're coming. It's only a question of when. And there they are, the head of the peloton. Still no sign of any one particular team doing all of the work because of the way they're fanned across the road. The back of the field, they're casually freewheeling down. some 45 kilometers to go, about 43, 42 kilometers left to go. That's approximately one hour of racing, slightly less, but they know that the two big climbs still lie ahead. The suppressor, and then of course, onto the Poggio itself. Not a difficult climb as such, but you have to be immensely strong and push a heavy gear to go with any attack that will surely come. These two have been swapping turns ever since they went clear. After about two hours, two and a half hours of the course, they went ahead of the field. Aldag joined by Piccoli, and for a while they were chased by Maurizio Di Pasquale and Luca Pavanello, but they were swept up um, on the climb of the Trocino Pass. These two survived, went over the top there ahead of Luc Leblanc, the former world champion, and back on the teams again after the Le Groupe Montfast last year. And now uh, he was swept up pretty soon on the descent. Now these two, I think, might not make the next climb, which will be the uh, Capo Berta. just keeping his tempo nice. The telecom team, the all-German outfit. Uh, the German amateur riders are rather distraught this year because uh, they know that it's the telecom riders who are probably comprise of the majority of places for the Olympic Games. And uh, one or two of the former top uh, West and East German amateur riders, who are now, of course, all Germany, still amateurs, feel as though they've lost their chance at the Olympic Games. We'll see. Nice round of applause, rather polite for the Italians. They're normally a little bit more ecstatic when they see an Italian rider come through, but they probably don't recognize this young man, Mariano Piccoli. I'm just trying to see over the motorbikes. Let's see if we can see the chase, but there's still a long, empty road back there. These two are just about holding them off. Aldag actually not looking quite as relaxed as he was a couple of kilometers back. Oh, when it's down to 24 seconds, so they must see them now, although we can't see the peloton, they must see these two now. The Tifosi out in numbers for the first big classic of the year as well. They love their cycling in Italy. Oh, my goodness me, have they got the stars or what? Oh, they're right on them. They've closed it down in double quick time. 24 seconds, what seemed like a few seconds ago, and the peloton just came out of the blue. Doesn't look as big as it did earlier, although there's still well over 150 riders there, I would think. Oh, and they both look back like a pair of bookends, and they're all in the peloton again. So it was just over 160 kilometers, that breakaway caught as we start the climb of the Capo Berta, which gives us still the suppressor and Poggio to follow. And now it's a free-for-all as Gavis tries to re-establish the command of the peloton. Inside 25 miles to go, and a lot of the adrenaline will start to surge now through the riders who think, right, now we can get on with this year's Milan San Remo. We're all together. Among the favourites in the start line today, well, I'm not too sure whether La Gazzetta della Sporto, the Italian sponsoring newspaper, was serious when they tipped Miguel Indurain, but they did. And they also tipped uh, Abraham Olano, Rolf Sorensen of Denmark and Casagrande. They were the riders they felt uh, might turn on the style today, but, you know, 
Over the years, Milan San Remo has often provided us with a surprise winner. You may remember a few years back when it seemed as though Moreno Argentine had the race sewn up and Sean Kelly made the descent of his life to catch Argentine in the last 500 metres and take the race. Andre Schmil has watched everything so far and he's now lying second wheel here. Former winner of Paris-Roubaix, a great man for the classics, looks as though he's found his early season form. That's Berzin alongside him. So Evgeny Berzin riding for Gavis, Playbus. He's also been prominent in the chase down of those two riders. A good indication that they're feeling a little bit perky today. Number 127 here is Rolf German, former champion of Switzerland, winner of the Amstel Gold Race. He's right there now. Now we've got the real men coming to the front. And I don't mean that in any way disrespectful to the two breakaways. Because if you don't attack, you'll never win. And sometimes it works. Ever remember the victory by Dirk de Mol in the Paris-Roubaix a few years back, who broke clear with Thomas Wegmuller, and the bunch never saw them again. Berzin, Schmil, Jermann. Now, Onse rider tucked in there, I think it's Zula. Yes, it is, Alex Zula. Still, the Motorola's are not playing a big role in this race. They haven't got a man up here yet. Although, having said that, about 20, 25 riders down, there is a blue and red jersey. It's a big turn by Berzin, turning that big gear up the climb here of the Capoberta. No assistance coming from the Lotto man, Schmil, just happy to watch. So different to amateur cycle racing, the professionals all have their system and their own tactics. You'd rarely see a single amateur make a long turn at the front like this. He would expect the others to come by and help him. But the big pros never look for help. They do the bit themselves and they seem oblivious to who's around them. And in fact, Bursey now is going to say, all right, if you can't come through, then can you follow me? Good acceleration, that. And he's going to kick again, look. But they've got his uh, drafting there and they're hanging on to it. And the arrival now, it looks as though uh, Lance Armstrong has come up there. So they've got a man near the front now in Armstrong. As we head over toward the top of the Capo Berta, we've uh, covered something like 254 kilometers. And the pressure on that climb, I think, has uh, shared a number of riders through the back door of the peloton. It doesn't look as big as it did when it picked up the two fugitives. Over the top of the Capoberta. Still Berzin up there, Schmil. Well, being at the front on these very narrow descents is the place because uh, you come down here unsighted, a touch of wheels, and uh, it's not unknown to have a shunt or two. Thirty-five kilometers to go. Descending at around 38 miles an hour. And in fact, the pressure gone off again now as we all breathe in down this narrow road here. These superb little towns peppered down the Italian Riviera. And I would be surprised if any of the citizens here bothered to travel up to Milan. The whole peloton of Milan-San Remo, 
filters its way through and they're now looking for the next attack. We're rushing on now towards the suppressor climb which is 5.8 kilometres long. It'll take them away from sea level up to 790 feet. And Motorola now have four men they brought up to the front as we've got through this town. The new signing on the team, Axel Merckx, is in the race today. They haven't brought their other man, Laurent Madouas, who's being probably saved for the stage races. Sean Yates is here. Their young sprinter, Max van Heeswijk. Well, I know that uh, the Italian television are cannot contemplate any other winner but an Italian. They feel as though they're doing well enough for that today. We've certainly seen plenty of the Italians at and near the front. There's Schmill again in the red. So easy to pick out. Very few red jerseys like that in the peloton these days. And there's Armstrong. And this rider here is Maurizio Fondrias, the great stylist. Robert Miller voted him the most stylish bike rider in the peloton. Rolf Yerman. Another rider who delivers the odd surprise classic victory when he can. He's a good rider. Nicholas Loda for MG, setting the pace. Loda, his teammate Yerman. Armstrong, they're all up here at the moment. Sorry about this little bit of picture breakup we're experiencing. It's the old problem with the microwave up to the helicopter. And this looks like Axel Merckx, the new signing for Motorola now. He's searching out Lance Armstrong to try and bring him up to the front. Now, the reason Motorola are getting twitchy, of course, is we're not far away from the suppressor. And this should be where the first serious attacks will begin. And if you can go with any split, well, who knows what will happen by the time we get to the Poggio. That peloton is much, much faster over the ground now. And then there's a little bit of an arrowhead on the front. So that's a sure sign that we are beginning to put the race under pressure. First round of the World Cup, and the winner automatically gets to wear the white jersey of leader of the World Cup when we go to round two, which will be the Tour of Flanders. And don't forget, forget that World Cycling Productions will be producing a tape of the Tour of Flanders, and that is one of my favorite races. MG, still using Loder at the front with Rolf Yerman. But they've got four, five riders up there now, MG. Well, they're thinking probably of Fabio Baldato or Michele Bartoli. I'd like to say they were thinking of Gianni Bugno, the champion of Italy, because that man can often deliver a surprise. And it's always a surprise with Gianni because we never quite know when he's going to race well or retire. I remember last year in the Tour of China, which was the first time that a race has ever been held in China, I was watching Zhani set the pace round the front of the bunch in a six-kilometre circuit. He refused to come off the front, and every time he came past the pits, the mechanics applauded him from his team, and he burst out laughing. That's the sort of rider he is, a very colourful character, but you never know when he's going to deliver, and my goodness me, he's been a great bike rider. A winner at Alpe d'Huez on two occasions in the Tour de France, and of course a world champion, Italian champion. These are superb roads for a bike race, plenty of bends and corners. If you can just slip away from that big peloton, you've got a chance. A bit difficult for the helicopter to find out where they've gone, but this one's doing a pretty good job. So the depressor is not far away. And MG are going to make sure they get the men to the top first. A quick rundown for you of the MG lineup today. Baldato is the captain. He were 121. Then we've got Bartoli, Bugno, Casagrande. Uh, that's Stefano Casagranda, by the way, not Casagrandi. Uh, Capilillo, Yerman, Salagari, and Nicola Loda. And they're using Loda at the moment to Yerman as the pacemakers. 
So that leads me to feel that they're pinning the host possibly on Bartoli or Baldato. Remember, it was Michele Bartoli who rode so well in uh, the end of season classic last year, the Tour of Lombardy. All of the MG boys. The telecom are getting their men to the front again now, having recovered from the shock of seeing Aldag caught. Well, they still have plenty of men who could do it, but the most likely winners in the sprint will be Jan Urich or Olaf Ludwig or Eric Zabel. They're the men who could easily take this in the sprint, and of course, telecom know it. And Motorola now come to the fore as well to drive on. Sean Yates on the far left of our picture saying his farewell to Milan San Remo this year. This marvellous British cyclist who was in the Olympic Games in 1980 where he set a world record in the team pursuit at the time. It only lasted about two minutes because the next team up bettered it, but even so it was a world record um, along with Malcolm Elliott in that squad. And then he turned professional having uh, gone to France to join the ACBB, the nursery club in the Billon-Biancourt area of Paris, and then on to the Peugeot professional squad. That gives you some idea of the speed. And the gaps which are now forming at the back of the peloton because of that speed. You only have to catch one rider in the line now who's feeling tired, opens the door, and you can have ten riders in trouble at once. Well, we'll try and uh, see if we can catch these, the idea of all of these MG riders up front, because it's the ones who aren't making the pace who will be the protected riders, and that will give us some idea as to who they're trying to get to the line first. I would suspect Bartoli or Baldato. Well, you can't get to much lower than that to sea level, and the Cipressa is on its way towards us. Rolf Jarman swinging out his right arm, calling his teammate through, but uh, when you swing out your right arm, you're supposed to slow down, Rolf, so the teammates can come through, because he didn't ease off the pedals at all. This could actually be the start of the lower slopes of the Cipressa here. And we've got Motorola getting on to the front. Yates setting the pace, gritting his teeth. Sean will go as hard as he can till he can do no more. And that's it. He's now swinging off and disappearing into the peloton. You can see him going down to our right. And Yates will probably drop off the back of that bunch now, 30 kilometres to go. Well, that was a fine turn of effort by Sean Yates, I'm not quite sure though what it achieved. Well, we're having a little difficulty bringing these, these shots from our motorcycle camera and because of the speed and the narrowness of the road, that's why we're continually cutting away to the helicopter, but this is now a little bit of a war of attrition amongst the front runners because we've had another change of team at the front as all of the men are being told to get up there, keep the pace high in the hope that their sprinters will be in at the kill. But you know, Milan San Remo is not often a race for the fast finisher. You've got to have the strength to go with the last move, which is certain to come on the Poggio. And it looks as though Berzin has got back up to the front. And there he is. So we've got two gay wrist boys. Now, when you get two teammates on a climb like this, it wouldn't be surprising if perhaps one tries to ease the other one away. And the peloton now, look at the length of it. The pressure has gone on. We're now into the final showdown. Here's poor old Sean, who made that big effort. 
now dancing around at the rear of the field and I think more or less content now to slip off the back of his final Milan San Remo. He'll be in at the finish though. As we start to pick our way through and you know, I thought for a moment we were saying goodbye to Miguel Indurain but I should have known better. That's Erwin Nyboer. Now you see the damage done by the speed all of a sudden. This is Berzin. Continual pace making here by Evgeny Berzin. Who is now still only 25 years of age. Comes from Vyberg in northern Russia, but he lives in Italy. And it does seem as though he might well be coming back. For him, 1995 was a disappointing year, though he got third in flesh well on. Won a stage on his birthday in the Giro, and then went on to finish second overall. But he'll always have the privilege of being remembered as the first Russian rider ever to win the Tour of Italy, which he did in 1994. On that occasion, by the way, in that year, he picked up 10 excellent victories. He's just giving me the impression he's coming back to great form here. And after giving me that impression, he's dropped back one slot. This is Rolf Jarman on the front now. He's also been very, very active today. Climbing the Cipressa here and Jarman keeping the pressure on. He's a very, very good climber, of course. Looks over his shoulder, but he's stringing this bunch out tremendously now, and he's even got a little gap there, too. At his greatest moment in 1993, when he won the Amstel Gold Race, and that was in a terrific sprint finish with Gianni Bunyo. Bunyo really was so confident, thought he couldn't be beaten, and Yarman showed him otherwise. But they've cracked that big peloton. It's hurting down the back. All the pressure of one man. Won the Tour of Luxembourg last year, picked up third place in his national championships. Didn't have a very distinguished Tour de France, he only managed 67th. And looking for no help at all here. The long, thin line of the pro peloton that we're going to see a lot of over this year. new layout of the international calendar now with racing going on into November with the tour of China is making it very whoa steady on boys almost overshot that one but the problem with the calendar now is that the big teams which are all being reduced in number by order of the governing world body the UCI to provide more competition it seems that uh, they're going to have to start the system of resting riders in the year otherwise they won't survive the full season of racing it's that tough Claudio Chiapucci. And little Claudio beginning to feel perhaps a little bit confident now because and we've got an attack going right away here. And this is a tremendous attack that's gone. And it looks like Gabriel Colombo of Gavis. It's his first ever Milan San Remo. He was the man that the uh, Gavis team has said to go, possibly to soften it up for somebody like Zanini. Or oh, Berzin take the pressure off the team now. It means other teams must chase and an attack by Colombo. Well, you can see the sort of gap that Colombo's made over the field, and this is quite a race now. Colombo really, I think he's probably here to spearhead for the rest of the gay this team. But look at him go on the Cipressa. Somebody is coming up to him. Now, Colombo is a man bang on form for this time of the year. He won a stage and the overall in the Tour of Calabria. He also finished fifth in the recently ended Terranno Adriatico. So he's not really a surprise at the moment, although in Milan San Remo, he's never tackled this distance before. Now, that looked as though it could be Gonchenkov. It is Gonchenkov who's come up. 
So Alexander Gonchenkov, the Ukrainian rider for Roslotto, has joined him. Very, very strong Russian rider here, or former Soviet Union rider indeed. And Big Mig himself now has got himself onto the front. Wilfred Nelson slipping down the inside, the champion of Belgium. If this had been a flat finish, they'd be worried about him for sure. But these are the two riders who are not waiting for anybody at the moment. Gonchenkov is going clear, another attack now. This looks like Axel Merckx, who's trying to launch an attack, the newcomer to the Motorola team. Now Merckx looking over his shoulder, in fact, I think for Armstrong or Shandri. Schmiller's tucked in in second place. I think it's Alex Zula behind him, but uh, Merckx is not going to progress his attack until those other boys in blue catch him. That's very good thinking indeed. Back to the leaders, led by Colombo, only turned professional in 1994. And he's only 23 years of age. And he's joined by Gonchenkov. This is a good time to go. Still Merckx, still checking out to see who's with him. He's looking for, I'm certain, Armstrong or Shandri. And if they don't get on, he'll desist. And this is an interesting move now, and it's really caused a little bit of consternation among the riders. I don't think they would have expected the attack to come initially from Colombo or Gonchenkov. And they've got early two on the Chipressa. Well, although Gonchenkov has got on terms, I haven't seen him do any of the pacemaking at all yet with this young man, Colombo. He was the military world champion back in 1992, Gabriela Colombo. There's where we are, almost at the peak of the Chipressa, with 22 kilometers left to race. There's what's left of the peloton. Look at how small it is now. Just took one big attack to blow off the back all of those riders who are gathering kilometers. But this man is really on a ride now. Two young riders in effect because Gonchenkov himself uh, didn't turn pro till 1993 when he turned for Lamprey. So the pressure off Gavis. Gonchenkov's team will be very happy to see him up the road as well. On the descent of the Chipressa. And that looks like a little advanced group of around about 25 riders now that they've got across on a ripping attack by Axel Merckx up the climb. There they are, not so far ahead. There should be a regrouping off the bottom of the Chipressa and then the Poggio will be the big showdown. Alexander Gonchenkov uh, started his pro career with a great third place in the very fast classic between Paris and Tour. Then we met him in Great Britain when in the Tour of Britain there, he finished seventh overall in 1994. Pushing the pace on. Just a shade under 40 miles an hour on the descent here. And that group of riders, I think maybe 15 riders in this pursuit here. And we haven't, uh, because our cameras can't possibly get amongst the riders on the motorbikes right now, we're going to have a job picking them all out just for the moment. Might well find that they regroup here on the descent. Certainly Baldato and Zanini are in that group. And I think Cipollini is in there too. So if they do get up, Cipollini's going to feel his tail go up in the air because he'll have a real chance. In and out the coastal ports as we head down now towards San Remo. Which is coming close very, very quickly indeed, and not quick enough for the two riders in the lead, Gabriela Colombo of Gavis and Gonchenkov of Roslotto, the ZG Mobili.
This is Maurizio Fondrius' team, by the way. He's the leader. But he'll now have to play the blocking tactician, the runner-up from a year ago, because his man, Alexander Gonchenko, is out in front. They come out of these corners holding those heavy gears. And I'm yet to see Gonchenkov assist Gabriela Colombo. Just 12 miles to go. Well, these are two names I don't think uh, you'd have found near the favourites list at the start. Today, in Milan, the 87th Milan San Remo, and we've got two young cyclists, they're not long in the pro ranks, are out front. Now a counter-attack coming and a very fast move indeed. Now it looked like a rider from MG. And getting across too. Now this looks like Copper Lilo. Mikela Copper Lilo has somehow got off the front of the group and this looks like Max Chandry. It is Max Chandry. Chandry somehow too has decided he can't wait for any of the climbs because these two riders are not going to get caught. That's his feeling. And that's caused the reaction from the field and I'm not surprised. We've got Copper Lilo up front. And we've now got Max Chandry trying to bridge the gap as well. Coppolillo is on. We've still got the Poggio to come. Chandri is desperate to get on and he's going towards them. No wins at all last year for Michele Coppolillo, by the way. And he finished 42nd in Milan San Remo. But he's not a bad rider because he, he came up with a fourth place in the championship of Zurich. Close uh, to the big victories, but never quite managed to pull one off. And now Max Chandry has made contact. So, Motorola's favourite. Whoops, number three nearly took him out there. But Chandry is back on now, on the line. And his hat's gone to the wind. Max latches on. These are four good riders. But I'm not sure that they can hold off the whole field because just take a look back. There they are, right on them, luck. Coppolillo, Konchenkov now is putting his weight behind the move. Nothing in it at all as we're rushing towards the Poggio climb. But we've got three big teams there. It's really up to the Onse team now to try and create a reaction. Andre Schmil still hovers near the front of the peloton. He's fourth at the minute, but he has missed every move so far, yet he's been in the position to go with them all. There's Baldato, a little bit handicapped now, possibly. Because his teammate is up there, but he's having none of it. He's going by himself. Oh, no, he's not. He's trying to catch up with one of the riders. Looks like uh, it's possibly Zula. But he's gone right by Alex Zula. And Baldato is one of the exciting riders on the circuit these days. Fast sprinter, Tour de France stage winner, but sadly taken out in the crashes last year. And that little group of four, I don't think he's going to go anywhere. And this is the leading group, Chandri. They are just right there, aren't they? They shouldn't have all those motorcycles in the gap right now, because that's a little unfair for these four riders. And, uh, in fact, the race organisation on the left there trying to clear a gap. As you can see from the man behind, too. I think he's shouting at our cameraman, actually, but we can't move, otherwise we couldn't show you the pictures. There's the little group behind, which is thinned out progressively, and yet he's seeing riders sprint off the front. They've brought them all back except the four. Colombo, Gonchenkov, Shandri, Coppolillo.
It's up to Rabobank or Anse now to chase them down, and Festina, and Festina has got to the front. Baldato's back in third place to disrupt affairs. Colombo looks across. Max Chandri must fancy his chances against these three. Chandri is a good sprinter in a small group. He's not the mass bunch sprinter, but my goodness me, give him a group like this, and he can well handle himself. Stage winner of the Tour de France, of course. And the big classic winner last year when in Britain he won the Leeds Classic. The British press on that occasion weren't sure whether to call it a British win or an Italian win because, of course, Max Chiandri has always lived in Italy and his Italian tends to be a little bit better than his English. And there is the leader of the World Cup, well, let's say the winner of the World Cup, number 134. Johan Museu, beginning the defence of the title he won last year. He was given that jersey at the end of the Tour of Lombardy, and he comes out in it today at the start of the new campaign. But the winner of the race today will be the person who will wear that jersey in the Tour of Flanders, and it's beginning to look as though it might come from the four leaders, but of course this bunch is now going to gamble on a springboard on the Poggio. There's a lot of action here, and the MG boys are still working hard, despite the fact they've got Coppolillo up there. A little bit unfair, perhaps, because Coppolillo has got his chance. He's taken it well. But the serious attacks have got to come from Onse, and here they are. Melt Giordamauri. Former winner of the Tour of Spain, and what a great service he was to Jalabert in last year's Tour de France. Remember him on the road to Monda? Well, Jalabert won on Bastille Day for the French, but not before Melchior Mauri had done an awful lot of damage in that breakaway in helping uh, Laurent Jalabert escape Miguel in Jurain. Now it's up to Melchior to work his little heart out here because he's not planning to win for himself, but if he can get one of his sprinters up, well, I'm not too sure with Jalabert whether they've got any sprinters. I suppose uh, Neil Stevens might, because he's got good form, or Alex Zula particularly. But now the Tifosi are shouting. They've only got one Italian to shout, well, two Italians to shout, four out of four, so they've still got a 50% chance of winning, I suppose. Great concern here by the breakaway because they know they're not going anywhere. Now into the darkness of the tunnel. Quick blink, quick lift of the sunglasses. And as you can see, we can't go through tunnels with our, with our signals because the helicopter's above the mountain. So we'll have to wait for them to pop out again, but here comes the chase group. And there's little Neil Stevens now come to the front as well. In the center yellow as he sees his teammate launch an attack. Is it Zula? Doesn't ride like Zula. It might have been Maori again. Now, who comes out the tunnel first? Well, we're already out with the four leaders. They're now unloading the uh, excess baggage. I um, think they do that more for a psychological effect than for any actual saving of uh, weight. But it makes you feel good. It tenses you up, ready for the finish. But they still have the little climb of the Poggio to come. Max Chiandri knows uh, this group. He knows them all. He knows that basically he's better than any of them. If he's feeling good right now, he should be OK. But first of all, they can't afford to shirk their duty in the pacemaking because this break is right behind them. And our little bit of picture interference again being caused by all the trees in this region. There's Zula. Onse have missed the move. They've got to do all they can to bring it back along with Festina. The big teams have got their men up there. Gavis, Motorola, Ross Lotto, Fondry S team and MG. Four good teams know now that they've got no work to do except slow that chase down. Because a betting man wouldn't really give you uh, the odds on those four. And we've got another attack here. I think it's Melchior Maori again. And there's the world champion, Alano. Alano latches on very quickly. And in fact, this rider here is Melchior Maori. And Alano has latched on. Looks like Axel Merckx has hooked up at the back too. 
So, Merckx will shut it down. And the other two will have to do the pacemaking. Here, now, Gonchenkov. An acceleration by Max. A lot of concern faces in this breakaway, and well, there might be. But there's the gap, just a mere 20 seconds as Shandri steps on the pace. Neil Stevens now having a go. Stevens having an excellent season. He didn't ride as well in his native Australia in January this year. In fact, a year ago, he came here having won seven races, including the Aussie Championship. This year, his form was not good. He was rather upset and worried about it. When he left Australia, he in fact went to see his doctor in Canberra just before he flew back home, have a blood check, but the doctor said it's fine. But I think you're training too hard. Have a rest. Well, that seemed a pretty good idea, and now it looks as though Neil has found his form. He's had a terrific start, winning his first ever European stage race in February, the Ruta del Sol, and uh, now he's just riding better and better and better. Now we swing on to the Poggio. This is the showdown time. They've got a lead of 20 seconds. Shandri goes through. Colombo hangs on to Shandri's wheel. Not too sure how Coppolillo feels, but I think tired. He's let the gap go, and Neil Stevens trying to get across. Quick drink for Neil. Confident after his victory in the Ruta del Sol, knowing now that without his official team leader, Lon Jalabert, the hand is free, and no doubt, Sir Saez, the team director, will have said, you can all have a go today, boys. If your chance comes, go for it, because the Onse team are such a great team. So Coppolillo sits at the back of this group now, seems to be the weak link in the four. But they are fully and totally committed because they are only a handful of seconds ahead of the chasers. Colombo stamping on those pedals, the man that started it all as we started the climb of the Chipressa. There's the slopes of the Poggio. There's the speed over the ground of that peloton. They are ripping along. It's only a select group, three, six, nine, 12, 15, maybe 19 or 20 riders in that group. This is the face of Gonchenkov. Konchenkov now wants a little help, so he gets it. Shandri comes through and does his little share. We head up towards the top, then it's the twisting descent down to the finish, and then it'll be a sprint. Shandri comes through. His turn too much for Coppolillo. Coppolillo really is in trouble now. If they survive, it'll look like a fourth place for him. And Max Shandri flicks his right arm and calls through Gabriella Colombo. Colombo not afraid to come through. Another gutsy Italian rider coming in onto the scene in a big way. Shandri takes a good look at Coppolillo there and I think has accepted the fact he's dead. And he can't get much out of him, so he slipped back into third place. He was just making sure, probably, that the Italian isn't shirking his turns. Because this is an unusual position for Coppolillo to be in. A chance of winning Milan San Remo. Gonchenkov leading the charge. Now, let's go back to the way the peloton is cracking on the climb of the Poggio. Alex Zula trying to get a real close-up of the cameraman there and use a little bit of slipstream, no doubt, from the motorbike. Baldato in second place. Zanini was also right there. But they're all handicapped by the attacks of their teammates up here. It's the Onse boys who have got to try and close the gap. They must have caught Neil Stephen. I didn't see him. Max is testing them now, and he's going to make them work that little bit harder to close the gap. They'll force Coppolillo to come across. Coppolillo does it. It's amazing where you find the strength from when you know you're, you can win a classic race. This is the tricky descent. One, oh, did I just say that? And that was nearly the end of uh, Gabriel Colombo. I was about to tell you the tale of when, uh, when a French rider called Gomez and the former World Pursuit champion Alain Bondu were clear, and Bondu crashed on this descent, and it cost him Milan San Remo. Second of victory was his, so not second, but victory, I think, was his against Gomez. But he never got a chance to find out. He fell off on the descent. There's the crowd. They're nowhere to come and watch Milan San Remo. Watch the first six hours on television and the last ten minutes on the Poggio. And that about is Milan San Remo.
And Colombo has attacked, followed by Gonchenkov. There's a lot of frisky legs, and Coppolillo grits his teeth and hangs on. He's getting whipped around the back end. It must be about a force 10 gale back there, but he's hanging in. Gonchenkov still keeps the pace. Colombo looks around. Shandri now must be feeling increasingly confident here. He's holding on nicely to them all. He doesn't look stressed. Constantly checking to what's happening behind because there's nobody can inform them at this point. There's no cars can reach them. A puncture now, for example, which we would certainly not wish on any of these four great bike riders, would spell disaster for them. There'd be no service till the breakaway has been caught and passed. Just listen to that crowd. And listen to the crowd. It's enough for Gabriela Colombo. He's gone again. Shandri accelerates to follow. We're coming up to the top of the Poggio. So first over the top will certainly be uh, Gabriella Colombo, but the gap is being closed by Maxi Shandri. Oh, they've got service up there now, so the gap must be up to half a minute. Goodness knows how that car got through that little pack on the climb. And all the cameramen trying to get the shot that they'll use in the papers tomorrow if the attack, as it so often does, comes on this climb. Colombo has launched a strong attack there. Shandri had no problem in mastering the attack. Gonchenkov in there too, and Coppolino, Coppolillo rather, hangs on. I wouldn't trust him as far as you could throw him right now because if he's still there when he sees the finishing banner, it's amazing how you can find the strength to sprint. Gabriello signals Shandri to come through on his inside. And he's still just over 20 seconds. Here's where we are, the end of a long day. Down the Tocino, onto the Poggio summit. Five kilometers from the finish, three miles. Virtually all downhill once we go over the top. There's the peloton. In that peloton, a flying glimpse there of the Motorola team. Lance Armstrong in there. But these are the four who have taken the race to the people and are now hanging on to a lead. And Max Chandri here, riding in the colours of Motorola once again after a little break with MG. And I know he's very happy to be back on an English-speaking team. It's a great team of musketeer status, all for one and one for all. And I know that Max now would really like to get them off to a great start with a classic victory. He's in the absolute position to do that. We're going down the Poggio. And our picture breakup is going a little bit mad here as we bounce down what is not a good surface. But now we can see these four riders. Surely they are going to survive. There's no Sean Kelly in that chase group to accelerate across like he did a few years back to catch Argentine. He went at this very point and he just descended like a stone. Rolf Sorensen was leading the peloton and he couldn't go with Sean. He watched him go, but he could do nothing about it. We still have four riders. It looks like a four-man sprint now. Max surely can win a four-man sprint. He won a small sprint into St Etienne in the Tour de France last year. Similar sort of breakaway, actually. It wasn't too far ahead of the field. He went over the foothills outside the back of St Etienne before they dropped down to the finish there. Certainly in this group, Fondrias is doing a good job at blocking off for his teammate, uh, Gonchenkov. Four kilometres, two and a half miles, hugging the wall, breaking hard, swinging left down the corkscrew descent of the Poggio. Past all the greenhouses of this... Uh, garden center town of San Remo. The gap is closing, it's down to 14 seconds. It's not for the nervous, this finish. But surely, because of the nature of the running, they won't even bridge 14 seconds. Gobelillo still sitting there at the back. Gonchenkov is a good finisher. Colombo, I don't really know his ability as a sprinter. I don't think he's that great. Certainly, Shandri can sprint. Gabriela Colombo won the best part of 30 races uh, during his years as an amateur rider before he turned professional. 
He lives in Varese, which is where the Tour of Lombardy started last year. 3K to go. Left knee out, keep your balance, touch of the brakes and keep going. Turning those huge gears as we continue to descend now into San Remo with the peloton now at 11 seconds. There's no time for finessing. The riders have got to stay totally committed to the cause. Not a lot of time to do, dream up the tactics to win the day. It could well be that Coppolillo has actually told the other three he is finished because they're paying him no attention. And he might well have said, forget me, I'll take fourth place. He might. There's the breakaway. It looks less than 14 seconds now. This is the running now. We'll soon to see the one kilometer to go banner. And the clock counting in seconds, the gap. Wait for them to come round that bend. It's still reasonable. It's certainly a winning gap. There's no doubt about it now. It's gone out again. There they go. Approximately 20 seconds. So that's enough now as we've got about a kilometre and a half to go. May even be at the kilometre sign now with the leaders. Here they are. The long straight finish now. Two kilometres to go. Gonchenkov rushing through on the right. Shandri making uh, Gabriella Colombo to swing over. Shandri, don't wait for Coppolillo. And Shandri should have known better than to allow that gap. He's now gone across to the two leaders. Gonchenkov also moves over. Colombo taking a good look at Shandri on the right of the road and continues to go, and I think he's gone. Now, that was a move we could have read in the papers because it was obvious. And Shiandri is looking over his shoulder and trying to make Coppolillo take it up, and he can't. Gabriella Colombo has gone for the longest sprint of his life here, about a kilometre and a half to the line, about a mile from the finish. He's put his head down, the man that started it all, and look at the gap he has opened. And I think, you know, Shiandri has made one of the biggest mistakes of his career. Looking underneath his armpit there to see who's coming. Shandy, all the pressure on him now because the other two aren't going to help. And Gabriela Colombo in his first Milan San Remo is going to win it. What a result. They're not going to bring him back unless he makes a mistake. He's gone round that corner on his rims as he lines up for the finish now. Shandy looks over his shoulder. There's always a little bit of, uh, a little bit of difficulty in the makeup of Max Shandy. He makes these mistakes and he's made a big one today. As now Gabriella Colombo starts the season off yet again for the Italians with a win in a big, big way. Your first Milan San Remo, your first World Cup Classic win, and what a victory it's going to be. The sprint is for second place now. Colombo is full of fire, he knows it's his. He's not going to tire in sight of the kite or the finish. The former military world champion in 1992, the spin start behind, Gonchenkov comes after him, but it's all too late. Colombo, Gonchenkov, Coppolillo and Max Yandri fourth after all of that on the line. He will be very, very, very disappointed with that performance. Thousands of us would love fourth in Milan San Remo, but today, Max Chiandri, I'm sure, believed that race was his. Here's the battle now, which will be for fifth place. And it's going to be a tough one. Baldato is trying here. As they come up towards the line, so too is Alano, but it's going to be, I think it's Zanini. And it's Zanini right on the line. And in fact, it was Johan Museo in white, not the white jersey of the world champion, Alano. But now the first leader of the World Cup will be Gabriella Colombo. A surprise to everyone, but on this occasion he richly deserved it. And this is how it feels to be a winner of Milan San Remo, watching the rest sprint for second place. And so for Gabriella Colombo, he's talking here to the journalists from the Italian television, and he's saying that his team worked brilliantly for him today especially Evgeny Berzin, who was blocking for him as they made the final charge down into San Remo. A couple of weeks after San Remo at the Tour de Flanders, Paul Sherwin spoke to Max. So, Max, a little bit of a deception in Milan-San Remo. It looked as if that was going to be a great classic victory for you, and it escaped in the last kilometre. Well, you know, uh, every race has its own story, and unfortunately, Milan-San Remo had a bad story for me, bad ending. Looked pretty good. Uh, the last uh, 10k, you know, but it kind of just slipped away, you know, and there's not much you can do. You can talk about it for a long time, but 
I got a fourth place and that's about it. <laughs> and this was the move that cost Max Milan San Remo. In fact, Gonchenkov launched the attack. Max didn't follow. He was waiting for Capolillo. And then Colombo realized that Max was not quite on the wheel, immediately counted on the wrong side of the road. As Max went to follow Gonchenkov's wheel, he had to react. It was all too late, and the gap was opened. And Chiandri was destined for fourth place in Milan San Remo. And Colombo, in his very first try, was the winner. That's the trophy. You always have to go to weight training classics to win a, a classic event in Italy because the trophies are so big. As he waves at the crowd, we'll have a look at the final result. Colombo winning in just over seven hours from Gonchenkov, Capolillo, Chandri, Zanini bringing home the peloton at 32 seconds in the end, ahead of Baldato, Cipollini and Museo. This was a really good race over the last two hours and I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope I'll see you on further tapes and World Cycling Productions throughout the season. Until the next time, goodbye.